If only they knew the hub for young business minds. Yes, people, it's Ted Lawler, and welcome back to the If Only They Knew podcast, sponsored by MindKite, the mindset and well-being platform that is helping thousands of people with their mental health. In this episode, I speak to Hannah Rankin, who's a professional boxer, professional musician, and a great role model for so many people. We speak about ambition, how to be successful, and so much more. So if you're wondering how to reach the high heights of your industry in a realistic way, this is the podcast for you. Brilliant. So I'll start off the same way I did um, in a similar fashion to the Fabio Wardley conversation. Um, and essentially, I just want to ask, how does it feel to be one of the most exciting boxers in the UK? Um, and the reason I didn't say female boxers is because I wondered, I've seen a few interviews and quite a few female boxers don't like that divide between male boxing and female boxing. So a twofold question, how does it feel to be one of the most exciting boxers? And yeah, what's your thoughts on that female male divide? Um, you know what, it's, it's really great to be a, a boxer at this time, especially a female boxer, actually, because uh, women's boxing is massively on the rise. So to be at the forefront of that and be involved at the elite level is just really, really exciting and kind of, yeah, really honoured to be up there and working hard to change things for people coming through. So that's the exciting part of it. Um, the female male thing. So definitely, I mean, it, it's a basic fact. <laughs> some of us are women and some of us are men. So you kind of have to accept that. Um, uh, but, you know, you, you have the same divide in all sports, I think. So I understand why people want it to be um, just boxing because then we, we wouldn't be taking into account that it's women boxing and that might change like the level of ability or technique or something. Cause it used, that used to be a problem. You know, it used to be always like, Oh, the women's boxing is like, you're not as technically as good as the guys, but that's changing now. You know, you've got some fantastic fighters out there. Like, you know, obviously Katie Taylor's just smashing it up. So um, <laughs> yeah, you know, there's no divide there, but I think it's fair to say women's boxing and men's boxing because you know, there's men and women. That's all I can say. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. No, and you're so right as well. Like, it's, it must be so good to have that opportunity. Like, it, funny enough, obviously, do you, I guess you know Ellie Scottney. Yeah, she's so, my yeah. good friend. And actually, yeah. I was meant to be on the card with her when she made her debut. Mm. But that's when my fight fell through. So I got to stay. And, and I was actually one of the few people in the audience for it live. <laughs> oh, wow. That's, that's, quite a, that's quite a privilege in itself. Um, but, yeah, yeah no, I, I used to actually go to Lynn... Uh, boxing club with Ellie and yeah. even back then even though I was so young and I sort of I always thought wow it must be so difficult for being a female boxer at that time that this was probably four or five years ago I think now because it just like there wasn't like you said it wasn't that popular back then and people were still thinking oh I don't want female boxing and had such a weird view towards it but it's it's yeah you're right it's so good to have seen it from just a few years ago to where it is now that jump and the opportunities provided is just crazy isn't it yeah, it really is. And like when I started out, there really wasn't any other girls in the gym. Like, you know, it's just people looking at you going, oh, so is it like your hobby? You just, you know, giving it a go. And I was like, no, I'm actually a professional boxer. You know, that's what I also do is I do it alongside my other job. And he's like, oh, yeah, that's great. You know, very nice. Pat you on the head sort of thing. <laughs> so, But um, I think actually now that women are getting like, especially this year, women have had such a massive platform to kind of announce themselves on with, with Eddie Hearn doing all the female fights um, all the way through this year. Yeah. It's just meant that women have had a chance to showcase what we really can do. And we're super competitive. Uh, we're aggressive in the ring. We work just as hard as the guys. So it's nice for people to actually be seeing that for sure. Yeah, no, definitely. I almost prefer it if you did want to, like you said, split it. I do almost prefer the, the female boxing because it just, I don't know what it is because normally with the male boxing, I think you, I'm a casual, but I, I am sort of into the boxing at the same time. I'm, I'm sort of yeah. on the fence with that. So I, I only like like the big, the bigger division sort of thing, like the heavyweights and then in the smaller weights, only like the big names. But with the female boxing, it seems like everyone is just going at it. Like everyone is interested. And there's not a fighter that you look at and think, oh, I'll give that a miss. Any female fight is just 100, yeah. 110 <laughs> percent. You know you're going to get uh, a spectacle, you know? I totally agree with that, actually. And I think that's what the, the, the casual boxing fan has actually really got behind because mm -hmm. they know that whenever it's a, a women's fight, we're coming out to give it 150 million percent. And yeah. we've only got two minutes in our rounds. So mm -hmm. we've got to go like 
help for leather <laughs> you know <laughs> and whereas with the guys they've got three minutes they can set stuff up they can take their time uh very jealous of that i would love to have three minute rounds <laughs> but yeah well, hey. why, why is it that they because i've never understood that i always knew like from the get-go that it was two minutes but what is the reasoning behind that i've never understood it so the general from what i can gather the general reasoning is that women we carry more water than guys and right. we would like sweat out more over the period of time so we'd be more at risk for injury i think that like uh -huh. brain injury sort of thing uh -huh. but i don't know how that that's based on kind of one study um <laughs> and there's a lot of girls obviously in the ufc and they train they go for like five minute rounds it's you know it is what it is and all of the amateur girls especially like um elite level team gb uh, they're fighting three minute rounds now so i think it's only a matter of time hopefully <laughs> when we change it over to three minute rounds or maybe um we'll get like instead of three minute rounds we'll have 12 twos for a world title fight that's what i would propose yeah. just as like a, a stop gap before we change it through because it would really add levels to the game 100 percent. yeah no definitely it'd be good to see as well but before we dive a bit deeper into the boxing i always uh People always laugh at me because straight away, it's like my first question, we just go straight into it. But it, I like to pull it back a little bit and sort of look at what people were like when they was younger. Because I think it gives a really good indication of sort of who exactly they are now and why. So if you don't mind, what was you like when you was younger? Obviously, you grew up in Scotland in a town yeah. called Luss, Luss? It's a village called Luss, yeah. Yes, that's it, yeah. Yeah, how yeah, was that? Yeah, it's very small. Um, so basically, I grew up uh, at the top of a glen right beside Lass, so even more sort of remote on a farm uh, with my two younger sisters. And we went to the local primary school in Lass. There was like 27 kids in the whole school, <laughs> primary <laughs> one to primary seven. <laughs> so wow. it was like full-blown like village life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very, very small. Um, and I don't know, like, because obviously we had the farm as kids. Um, we were encouraged to help on the farm as much as possible. My parents, we always had like loads of jobs to do. Like we didn't go on big holidays because there was always work to be done on the farm. And so, yeah, we, we kind of left our own devices free to roam, like spent a lot of time outside, very adventurous kids. And yeah. we're very, all me and my two younger sisters were all like, incredibly independent. <laughs> um, and I think that's something that we got from our parents, which I'm very thankful for. Um, but yeah, no, kind of left to our own devices, always making up stories, adventures, you know, the usual sort of stuff. Yeah. What about qualifications then? Because, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I feel like if you was in a tiny class, you got a lot more sort of teacher to student time. So did you do yeah. well with your qualifications or was your mind sort of focused on other things? Uh, yeah, I was really good at school, actually. Um, I enjoyed school. I enjoyed learning. Um, and obviously, yeah, so basically from primary one to primary four, I was the only one in my year group. I mean, I was in the same classroom with two other year groups, yeah. but I, like I was the only one in there myself. Wow. Um, and then a boy joined my class. <laughs> so it was two of us. <laughs> so I think the way that we learn in the, like, a, like a village school like that, you all learn the same sort of uh, topics. So say you're doing history and you're studying like, I don't know, the Victorians. Yeah. Everybody studies the Victorians. You just have age and ability assess work. Right, okay. um, yeah. So it, it's, it kind of helps you learn quite quickly and also you tend to have like you, you go ahead of yourself quite quickly yeah. so yeah when I went to secondary school I was quite far ahead with, with what I wanted to do and um yeah no I did uh I did six six hires instead of five so I kind of pushed myself a little bit and good, it was yeah. good but then I left to do music so I didn't actually need any of those qualifications <laughs> for doing that <laughs> but I enjoyed learning so it was yeah. good well, well on that point because obviously the, the reason I like to, I'm starting to get boxers on this as well, because I think boxers, entrepreneurs, no matter what you are, if you're at a high level, you all share the same mindset. But on, yeah. on, on that point there about sort of needing qualifications, I always try and, because my audience is very young, so I always try and find out from the guests, what are your view, views on qualifications? Do you think you need them? Do you think it's a good sort of stopgap whilst you figure out what you want to do or What's your sort of takes on, on doing, going through that traditional system? So it worked for me, mm. um, but then I didn't actually use it in the end. <laughs> so, you know, like I always say to people, school is there to, for you to make what you want of it, really. Yeah. I think um, if you're a more practical, hands-on person, going into apprenticeship at 16 is a much, much better idea for a job than sticking it out and then kind of going to university 
not really enjoying the academic side of it, but just racking up a huge amount of bills. And yeah. then at the end of it, you come out and do something practical anyway. So, uh, I, you know, like my, my opinion is if, if you enjoy something in particular in school, but it's not necessarily the most academic route, still go down that route, do what you enjoy. But school is a great test um, of your own abilities as well in that, are you able to work in a team with other people? Like, can you knuckle down when the, the, the going gets tough? Can you sit down and actually apply yourself to different tasks? Because don't look at it like, how smart am I? But more like, can I actually achieve these things? Because I think, sometimes people get all het up with the grades and the, and the numbers. It doesn't, it, I don't want to say this, but yeah. in the long term, it doesn't really matter yeah. because you'll end up, if you, if you really want to do something that you love, you'll end up doing that and you'll find a way to make it happen. Mm. I just think that school's a great way to teach us many other life skills other than just thinking about paper and pen, basically. Yeah, no, that's a good answer, actually. And I think, yeah, you're definitely right. No matter what situation you're in, whether it's school, or college or just a work environment or a gym if you just sort of take it for what it is and take almost take like every opportunity as a as a opportunity to learn something from that no matter even if it's the worst situation in the world if you yeah. look at it through that lens and say okay well it's terrible but I have to go through it anyway so if I can take out certain things that I know will help me when I go past this stage I think that's the best thing and that's pretty much what you said Absolutely, totally agree. Um, and I think there's a lot. There's always been a lot of pressure on kids to get like like top grades in school, and this is very important. Else, you can't progress, and you can't go on and do these things. And and actually, like both my younger sisters, they didn't really love school. Um, Emma, my middle one, she left. She'd been in Australia ten years, but wow. she like she's co-managed two and a half thousand cow dairy farms. Like she's a great manager. Yeah. Um, and she's got great skills, but you know, school just wasn't for her. She's very practical, super great with, she's got a great business head. Um, so like working in that environment in farming, same for Alice, exactly the same, you know, um, she came back to study a degree after having worked for like five years after school. And she found that really, really hard because actually she was used to getting up, earning money in the day focusing on things, having a, a routine, whereas actually being a student was a nightmare for her because there was no routine. <laughs> and um, yeah, it, it, she ran it hard, but you know, she's used that and then gone on and done something else that she wants to do. So mm. it's, it's not the be all and end all. And I think you've just got to take the good things from it. No, no, it definitely. And it, it depends on who you are as well. But one thing I wanted to ask you is how did you then get into the whole combat sports world? And obviously you did the music as well, because normally people correct me if I'm wrong but it's sort of from what I've seen people normally go for the completely academic route going to a nine-to-five or they go down the creative route and that's either like music or yeah. a sport and it's not normally all three and it seems like you've done all three so how did you get into the music and the sports? So um, I, my, I come from quite a musical family Right. Um, from a very young age, there was always music in the house. My mom played the piano, the French horn and the cello, but she picked the French horn up really late. Um, and my granddad was a music teacher. Um, so it was really encouraged in our house to like listen to music, sing, do all that sort of stuff. Um, and so me and my two sisters all played instruments from quite a young age. Uh, we started on piano. I was never naturally very talented at piano. <laughs> my two sisters were, but not me. Uh, <laughs> then. I went on to flute and um, bassoon and my sisters are violin and cello and it's like the Bond Trap family but um, <laughs> yeah we, we all went to like lots of music camps and stuff with that so oh, okay. it was kind of nice because we got to do the extracurricular stuff mm. so yeah that was good and from there when I went in like when we were younger we went to do loads of sports we were always encouraged to do whatever sports we wanted to do and all three of us did badminton, but when we were younger, we used to fight like cat and dog. So my mum was like, you're gonna go and do some sort of combat sport. I love that. <laughs> so me and my, yeah, me and my sister went to uh, Taekwondo at a really young age. Nice. Um, we used to fight with each other <laughs> and um, to compete in local things as well. So yeah, no, it was, that's how I kind of got into it. And music, and, and like Taekwondo or boxing, they're really disciplined, both of them. You have to be disciplined. Um, you can't just kind of have a go if you want to do well at them. And I think that's where my sort of kind of competitive nature was built as well. 
and also like my sort of discipline in sport. Um, so yeah, kind of got into it from that and then um, carried on with the music side of things, always focused on that yeah. um, and decided I was going to go to music college and that was it. And then when I was trying to get fit again, I got back into Thai boxing and uh, then when I went to London to do a master's in, in music still, I met my coach and uh, Derek Sweet D Williams mm. and they introduced me to boxing and I fell in love with it as well. So wow. yeah, that's kind of the route. Yeah, that's a crazy journey though, isn't it? Do you think then like, again, I guess the answer is always, it depends, but it's something I try not to say myself, but do you think that people should try try everything at least like, or like tr just get out into the world and try different things even if you think oh you know I, I don't like music now so why would I bother going to like a music class or I don't like sports why would I bother going to boxing do you think people should try these things or do you think they should double down on sort of what they've got set in their mind as what they like I know that's a bit of a, a tricky thing but no I think that's a good question actually because I think people want an answer to that they want an easy answer <laughs> so um for me my at a very young age my parents encouraged us to do whatever we wanted to do like with extracurricular yeah. so like it, it's really important to have other strings to your bow should we say like so it's good to go out and do these other things and and challenge yourself because you never know actually you might have a, a bit of a talent for it or right. you might have a natural aptitude um or you might just really enjoy it <laughs> you don't have to be great at something to to like do it you can just because you enjoy it it's great to take part mm. so i encourage people to step outside the comfort zone do something a little bit different or something they've always been curious about because you never know where it's going to lead you and I think for me, that's how I've basically got to where I am now. Because every time somebody suggested something crazy to me or gave me an opportunity, I took it. And I thought, why not? Let's do it. Exactly. And it didn't pay me in the beginning for a lot of things. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. it was all come back eventually. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sort of, yeah, no, you're completely right. I'm sort of going through something similar myself now. Last year, from last year, like beyond when I was younger and stuff, I'd always be like, oh, no, I don't, it's not for me. No, I don't think so. No, I'm doing something else. I'd always sort of shut opportunities down because I was so, I guess looking back, I was so nervous, like for them. Yeah. Like this year I made like a real conscious effort to just say yes to things, even if I can't do it. Um, I can't remember who said it, but there was a famous quote, basically said, you'll learn on the job, so just get started sort of thing. And, and yeah, 100%, that's what I've been doing this year. And you're right, doors just open that you would never have imagined like last year opening. So yeah. 100% you're right, just get out there, get started and you know, just see what happens, I guess. Yeah, I did, I did that for like, so obviously being a musician, you've got to find lots of work yourself. Uh, yeah, you, you start off, but like you don't start off in an orchestra when you finish college and all that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. you know? It doesn't work like that, <laughs> sorry <laughs> to say. Um, but um, you know, I always, every time something came up in college, even opportunities to play for different things, unpaid, I always took them because it was a great experience to learn some a new repertoire, meet different people, uh, go to a different country, do something crazy that you would never normally have thought you were going to do. And actually, like you said, these things have a snowball effect. So you say yes to one thing. So people know that, oh, she's game for doing that. They phone you up. Oh, well, there's a really great gig coming up. Would you want to do this? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I think by taking that first chance at something you didn't think you might enjoy or might be quite hard for you mm. it opens up so much more and that's that's happened for me my whole life and it's something I stick with for everything and yeah, no, I definitely again I agree this this year would just completely change my whole sort of outlook on that sort of thing but one thing I always try and sneak in because again this year it's something I've been looking at quite a bit is the idea of like what you mentioned there about doing things for other people and then it'll sort of come back full circle whether it's snowball yeah. or not um do you believe in sort of karma and, and, and that, that whole sort of weird mystical world? I always try and throw it in. So all my uh, typical listeners will be laughing at this point. But yeah, do you believe in that sort of thing? Or I don't know. Yeah. What's your sort of take on that? Yeah, I, I do. I'm very superstitious about things. Uh, <laughs> I've got my superstitions, always have done. And also, I, I do believe if you're putting out positivity, um, always try and like to, to better yourself and help other people with things good things will come back to you like a hundred percent believe in that like I'm not one of those people who thinks it's all kind of airy fairy nonsense I do think it's important because it does actually tell a lot of tell people a lot about you and yourself so try and be positive try and look on the, the positive side of things always try and find 
a positive light or a, like even just a, not even positive but like a different way of looking at it because yeah. you know it actually make you feel a lot better as a person for sure that always makes me feel better and a lot of it comes back to me as well so that's my yeah. general view on that yeah no that's good it's the same with karma and manifestation as well i always say to people like that say i'm not too sure i say well, even if it is a placebo, say like you, you, you think in positive thoughts, so therefore you're feeling naturally, whether you believe in manifestation, karma, or anything like that, whether you believe it and it, it, believe in it or not is a different story. As long as it makes you actually feel positive and start focusing positive things. Yeah. A placebo, but it doesn't matter. It's doing its job. So, you know what I mean? Job done sort of thing. Yeah. I did a lot of the stuff with that with Rob, Rob actually, uh, Robert Heisey. So like positive visualization of things. And, and I think visualization is a massive thing. Like you visualize where you want to be and what you want to be achieving and it will happen. It will happen. Yeah. And like, I firmly believe in that. And I think people can kind of try it on like a really low scale, you know, like mm. if you just start thinking about being, um, I, well, I want to be a happier person. Like I want to feel happier during the week. And you can just start with positive thoughts in the morning and visualizing these things and how it's going to make you feel better and visualize, oh, this is great. I get a break now. And you start to just, it retrains how you think about stuff. Yeah, so. yeah no, you're right. Then did you do white collar? Because I, like that, that sort of um, early, early times when you first started off boxing, did you do white collar and sort of, it, it, linking that to the visualization like did you ever think you would get to the stage you're at now because it's the same with Fabio Wardley as well funny enough it's almost like a coincidence that that sort of went went out for both of you like he did white collar as well and he's now at a great stage similar to you so yeah like back then did you ever think oh wow if I get if I can do this then I can go to the next step and then it will just snowball or what was your thoughts back then no so basically I, I would say probably because of my music and the way I, 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 I'm trained, really. I've got quite an obsessive nature about things. Yeah. So if I want to do something, I've, and people think obsessive is a, a negative word. I don't see it as a negative word at all. Um, I, I see it as a positive one, really. <laughs> but, you know, like I'm quite obsessive about what I want to do. So if, if I, I really enjoy something and I want to get better at it and I want to improve, I will stick at it a hundred percent and see with with boxing i really started it for fitness and i was enjoying learning a new technique i think that's something that really drew me to it you, you can't learn everything in boxing no. you you can't like yeah. you just can't and and that's great to have something that you can never fully ever be anywhere with you know yeah. so yeah i kind of fell into it that way and then i wanted to learn more and more and more then i went into white collar because i was like okay so i'm learning all these skills I want to try them out. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying them out yeah. in sparring, but I want to try it out in like a live competitive situation. Yeah. Uh, so I went into white collar, did really well at white collar. I enjoyed it and I kind of enjoyed the buzz. Like it, it really connected me to like performing. So I quite enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, and then I wanted to go to the next stage uh, to see, okay, what's my next level up? Mm. Cause I wasn't looking like miles ahead. I was just like looking each next step. Where can I go next to kind of be better? And uh, my coach was like, well, you could go join an amateur club, do this, this and this, blah, blah, blah. And in my head, I was like, okay, is that somewhere different? And who do I work with? And I said, do I get to take you? And, and Derek, do I get to work with you guys? And they were like, oh, no, we don't, we're not amateur trainers. Um, and I was like, oh, well, then I want to stay with you. What's the, how do I do that? <laughs> and they were like, well, you'd have to go pro. And I was like, okay, so how do I go about that? Wow. literally kind of completely unaware really of what it entailed at the time really <laughs> yeah you know yeah. but i was like let's let's go um and they were like okay first first best we'll go sparring with some of the pros to see how you get on yeah. sort of thing like <laughs> check out how you're doing yeah. um and yeah no that's kind of where it started and how how i went to but i enjoyed white collar um i think it's a great opportunity for people to try a new learn a new skill mm. so i'm not like one of these people who goes oh it's terrible you shouldn't do it <laughs> yeah. no no that's good it's, it's, it's good to see that you sort of went through it in a normal way like you didn't have this master plan from the very like the moment you was born like i'm gonna be this i'm gonna be that and like worked your way towards it it's good to actually know that for people listening as well, like things can just come naturally. Like you said, you say yes to one thing. You say, okay, this is good and I'm getting good at it over the weeks. How do I then get to the next stage? And you get to the next stage and every time you say yes, you get closer and closer to the things that you thought were once impossible. Like, I've got a vision board literally right next to me now that I keep looking at. 
Um, and it's like everything, I, months ago I created it and everything seems so impossible. And now because I'm just being positive and working my way towards it, now everything's getting closer and closer. And soon yeah. I'll, I'll have to take off some of the things on my vision board and replace them with even harder things. And I guess that's the same with what you've done there, just sort of step by step. And then now yeah. you're pro. Exactly, exactly. And you just have to kind of like, I think people give themselves a, a really like dramatic thing that they want to they want to do they want to achieve that right now <laughs> and it no, doesn't happen no. like that at all <laughs> I think you have to just kind of be happy with with what you're doing and then then if you want to go further create a new goal and mm. then the next goal and then the next goal and then you, every time you tick it off you're like yes okay I've done that I can do the next bit and so and that's kind of how my brain works I, I suppose it's kind of quite like a kid really he's like okay cool I get to tick that off of my list and I get I get this and I award myself with this <laughs> but yeah. it actually works really well and humans actually do respond well to like reward and you know achievement so <laughs> yeah no you're right as well about that almost like instant gratification I guess it's called but especially amongst the young people like, like even even myself I, I think I try and think positive and I try and think I'm not like that but I just am like, it's just, you're right. It's just a natural thing. You're like, Oh, but I could get that today or I could get that tomorrow if I worked for it. And you just want to just tick everything off today. Like you want it yesterday. Um, but yeah, I guess it's just about sort of that, that patience, I guess as well. I think if you don't think about it as patience, think about it. Like, uh, once you do something, uh, once you do do it and then you look back, that's, that's when you, you get the most satisfaction from something. So you achieve something then that's the time when you reflect, you look back and you go, that took me 45 days to get to this point. Yeah, yeah. And that's a whole 45 days of my life I've had to do to get to this point. I'm pretty proud of myself for that. That's 45 days. <laughs> you yeah, know, like that's yeah. the best way to look at it. Cause then you're like, okay, so the next bit's achievable because I spent that much time doing that. I can do the next bit. Yeah. And that's kind of how I think about things. No, and I think it's, yeah, you're right. It's, it's sort of what I'm get, gathering from this and from what I sort of hear from other people as well is about the journey and not necessarily the end goal because I know for a fact that when I do tick these things on my vision board off that I'm pretty close to getting now that I'm getting closer I'm sort of like ah, oh, don't almost don't want to achieve it like, I like the, having the carrot dangled in front of me so I can chase yeah. it there is, there's <laughs> definitely something in that that chase when you get it it's a bit Sometimes yeah. it can be a little bit disappointing. So have you ever experienced that sort of, oh, is this it feeling? <laughs> oh, is this it? <laughs> yeah. um, so I don't know if I've ever experienced the, oh, is this it sort of thing, but mm. I definitely, like, I suppose being a boxer, there's always like, you know, in your training camp and on the lead up to the fight. Yeah. Um, the, the experience of the fight is always so short mm. in, in the amount of work that you've done the actual occasion itself it's like you do this much work and then the occasion is this <laughs> and it kind of feels like it it just doesn't last that long yeah. like the actual moment and you want it to go a bit slower so you can just walk, like be involved in it even more yeah. uh, that's probably the only thing i can think of for me um but the eight weeks in the prior up to it there's that moment where you're, you're lying there and you're like i don't want to do another sit-up i don't want to pick <laughs> this damn thing up <laughs> yeah you know, that sort of thing yeah you've got to remember i'm enjoying the journey i really am <laughs> yeah yeah you've got to keep telling yourself that yeah what is the process like on the night then and sort of the, the build-up because that, that's one thing i've always wondered especially at that high level that you're at what is it like what's going through your mind like you said you've done the the three quarters of the work or even more than that really in the training or before the mindset stuff and then when you're sitting in that that locker room before what's going through your mind what are you thinking are you nervous like if you don't mind talking us through that from the the locker room to in that ring because I, I i watched the clarissa, clarissa shields fight um and every time she like even just threw a jab the crowd would go way like proper like on her side like so how does that that must be such an intense feeling like just knowing that you're almost you're pitched as the underdog almost like because I don't know I don't know about you but I almost like being the underdog but yeah what, what's the sort of process like for, for you on fight night um so I think so in the lead up to it like you do all the hard work in, in that prep time right so then when you get to fight week fight week's like the hard part really because actually for me I, there's not the regular training times you're not mm. doing everything at a certain time and focused on this and this you've just got to do a little shake out 
and then you have to eat at the right times. Um, you've got to make weight. That's the hard part. Yeah. Um, so it's just dealing with the sort of the pressure of everything building up um, and getting to like, yeah, I don't know, um, get into the moment and also just keeping everything just there so that you're ready to go when the time comes. Yes. Yeah. Um, but I think a, a phrase that I heard, uh, you know, Matt Fraser, he's the, the fittest man on the planet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, one of the phrases that he uses is pressure is a privilege. And this is a phrase that I like to live by. I love this. It's just like totally blew my mind when I heard it. And um, yeah, like that's the moment when you've got to deal with the pressure because yeah, you do get the butterflies and you're so nervous, but it's like, it's a real privilege to be put in that position and to be out there living your dream basically, because that's what you are doing at that point. So you've got to think about it that way and kind of, balance the sort of like the oh uh, to here to here to here <laughs> so yeah no uh, that's a phrase that I try and think of um and in the locker room you kind of get that nice little bit of calm just like before you start shadow box everything is a nice for me I get a nice bit of calm where I know I couldn't have done any more in my training I couldn't have done any more in the lead up to the making the weight nothing else that I could have done mm. so I have that nice sort of calm moment and then once, uh, you know, like, I'm like, okay, good. So what will be is going to be, and I'm going out there to smash it. That's how I feel about it. I'm super focused. Yeah, that's good. Do, do you have any sort of uh, expectations that you put on yourself? Obviously, you know, you've, you've done the, like you said, you've done the groundwork beforehand, but do you have any specific expectations? Like um, just in general, even like not even on the fight night, do, do you sort of have a set of expectations that you live by? So I have my, my expectations on myself are, um, well, obviously, I think every fighter expects themselves to go out there and win. Like, that is 100% <laughs> one of the main ones. Um, and also, I think the expectation on myself is that I want to do myself and my team proud. Mm. Like, I have high expectations on myself so that I represent myself and what I've been doing with my team the best that I could possibly represent that. Yeah. Um, because it's not just, like, it's not just about you at the end of the day, you're the only one, you're the one in there. And, and it's kind of like uh, my coach described it as like, um, you're the spearhead, like, and we're, we're the spear handle. We're the ones that get you to where you need to be. Yes, um, and you're the last person to deliver what needs to be done. Yes. So it's the best way to think about it. But for me, I feel like that I want to represent everybody, my team and all that hard work and effort they put into me the best that I possibly could. Hmm. so um that's my main things i probably the pressure i would put on myself before a fight yeah and to be able to execute a game plan that i'm given that's uh the important thing as well it's, it's kind of a yeah discipline really yeah no i like that and you you said after the the, the savannah marshall's fight that you sort of yeah again you seem sort of happy because you know that you you put in everything you could and you you come up against like almost like a monster <laughs> in the sense yeah. like i don't think anyone could have beaten her on that night so there's definitely sort of yeah you're right there's almost like no shame in in, in losing to someone at that sort of stage like she's crazy like so yeah, yeah. How, did, how did you sort of deal with that and yeah just 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 a loss in general really like even if it's not just in the ring like out, outside of the ring as well like any any negatives that happened to you? How do you sort of deal with that? So like, I was happy with my first three rounds of that fight with Savannah. Yes. Like I was executing game plan, everything was going really well. Um, and then I burst my eardrum at the end of the third. And um, like in the fourth, I was trying to do everything I've been doing before. Um, and like, obviously she'd up the pace as well. Like starting to put, you get the weight behind what she was doing. Yeah. and uh, so uh, no, taking nothing away from savannah her performance was really really good mm -hmm. but like i wasn't able to execute the things i was doing beforehand <laughs> so it's a bit frustrating for me and i couldn't figure out why because i didn't know what it was like i didn't i never had this injury before um so i think after this fight i was more frustrated that that had happened and i hadn't got a chance to continue doing what i was doing and how it was working and stuff yeah. Um, because yeah, like I, my team could see in the seventh round, I was rocking and rolling, but they could, I couldn't tell my lefts and my rights very well. Yeah. So they told me to take a knee and I've never taken a knee in my life. So like, but I did what my, my team after like many shouts, <laughs> I did what they asked me to do. I took the knee. Um, and the ref, he decided to wave off in the last 10 seconds. I mean, that was his decision and I don't resent him for that. Like yeah, yeah. my team would probably 
have given me checked me over in the corner and seen things so you know it's it is what it is so I, I'm never going to be angry with the ref for that mm. um but I think after that sort of fight I was more frustrated than losing because I lost over the 10 rounds um because I was frustrated with the injury but my coach always has a thing and he's like, right, we're the same kind of person. So we see each other the next day, as soon as the fight's over anyway. I was, um, I was there anyway, but we, we were like, right, let's break it down. So we always do that as soon as it's done, the next day. Um, same thing for sparring. We do it right after sparring or anything that I want to break down. So, and he says, right, three good things before you tell me anything else. Yeah, three yeah. positives and then we'll break everything else down. Like um, and it's the best way to think about it because you've got to think about what you did well. You've got mm. to give yourself a pat on the back. We're all really quick to go, oh, this was shit, that was shit, this was shit. <laughs> but actually, there's, there are good things out there, so you've got to look at that. Yeah. So I always do that, and I break it down. And then I talk about what I want to improve, and then we talk about what we're going to do in the gym to work on. Mm. Uh, and then I feel like I have a plan. And my mom always said to me, if, if something doesn't go well, like if I had an audition or something and I, it didn't go well or I didn't get the, the place, I'm allowed to feel like shit about it for about a day. I can be miserable, have a bad time. It can have a day, day of being grumpy about it. And then after that day is you got it all done then. And then after that, you've got to move on because it's mentally, it's, you know, it's draining. Yeah. So if you want to improve yourself, have your day of miserableness. And then the day after that, try to look forward to what you're going to do next to improve it and do it better next time. Yes, I love that. Thank you for that. Just before I get on to the, the final thing about how you're going to bounce back from that, um, I think it's too good of an opportunity to let down, if you don't mind. Um, what was your thoughts on Daniel Dubois? Um, he obviously went through quite a similar thing. Um, and yeah, I just wondered sort of what was your take on that and the, the pressure, can you understand the pressure that he, he was also under as well, much like yourself? So it's a very difficult situation for Daniel uh, after that fight. I, I, mm. like, I really feel for him because mentally he's be, going to be going for a really tough time. Yes. Um, he wasn't in, like he came out with the intention of making Joe quit. So I think it's mentally going to be really difficult for him. And it's when he needs his family, his friends around him to support him because okay. yeah, it, it's difficult. And I can understand he was in a lot of pain um, at the time, but he chose to take a knee um and then he chose not to stand up again mm. and i feel that maybe a lot of fighters are saying he quit and i think at that young age to take to make that decision yourself maybe not such a good thing because it should be your corner stepping in or like they could have thrown the towel and they they like well like maybe your eyes got one more round mm -hmm. so they maybe should have thrown the towel in or not let him go out for that round yeah. or if he stood up and the ref had gone no then it would look better on him. Yeah. At the moment, I think it looks bad because he chose to not stand up again. Mm. And that's, it sounds harsh saying that because obviously he's got a fractured eye socket and damage, uh, nerve damage and stuff. But I know a lot of the boxing community are just like, oh, he quit. Yes. And I think it's a shame because he's going to be going for a really hard time. Um, and it's how he comes back from that, which he's going to have to deal with, basically. Yeah, no, that, that's sort of why I wanted to ask it, because I think it sort of couples up with what you went through as well. And it, it, that, that's a, a lesson for anyone to take on, whether you're an entrepreneur, an athlete, or just someone like working in a nine to five. Um, but before we sort of wrap up here, I'd love to know what your future plans are, um, both in the, in the boxing world, like who have you got your eyes on, um, and just sort of as well in the music world as well, because you're doing so well in that. Like, let's not forget about your music career. Like, you're smashing it there. So, yeah, what's next for you? So, um, I'm going to be going to welterweight in the new year. Um, basically, uh, obviously middleweight's not my weight class. So in the new year, I'm going down to 147, which is more like my weight. It'd be my first time getting to that weight. Uh, but I won my world title at super welterweight. So I'm not concerned about it. I'm really excited about it. Um, so looking forward to that. There's obviously a lot of great fighters in the welterweight division. Yeah. But um, I've obviously got to get my first couple of fights at welterweight done. Yeah. <laughs> so before I start calling anybody out in that division, I've got to get my first few fights done next year. So that's my goal uh, around about March time to start that going. Um, and yeah, no, it's, it's really exciting, really. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, me and the team have got loads of things planned. And yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about it. Um, 
music wise I, obviously this year has been a total bummer like yeah. <laughs> i've not had any live performing <laughs> not oh, had any course, sort yeah. of like interactive stuff to do since february and it's been really kind of like a downer because like, i'm used to doing quite a lot of performing and also i have a quintet and my quintet goes into schools we go into like care homes and obviously that's been a big no-no um so i'm really missing that sort of interactive concert style thing um so i really hope next year things start to ease off and uh can go and do some more performing um but yeah no it's just uh yeah keeping things ticking over i've been working a lot with my students in music so proud of all of the young kids I work with they've just taken it like so in their stride so cool about zoom lessons <laughs> they're yeah, teaching me stuff about yeah. Skype yeah. so <laughs> yeah you know it's um I've been really focused on them and actually one good bit of news my little student did his first zoom audition for a local orchestra to start in the new year and he got the place so I'm, I'm buzzing for him <laughs> that, that is amazing I'm so glad you said that as well because a, a question I ask all my guests at the very end the final question is what do you want your legacy to be? And that ties in perfectly with what you just said there, because I, it sounds like you're doing a lot to help others and help bring for others, which is great to see. And it's quite refreshing, actually. So, yeah, what do you want your legacy to be? Um, well, in, in like the boxing world, I think I want my legacy to be me to be known as someone who took every challenge and every opportunity that I was faced with. And I gave it 150 million percent. And I fought everybody. I want that to come into it. Like, you know, like that's definitely something that's part of my legacy, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and also that I came from a totally different starting point than most people do in the boxing world. I like Fabio, we came from the white collar background and it is possible to achieve really good things yes. if, when you don't come from the same place as everybody else. If you really want something, and you, you want to put all that work and effort into it, you get a strong team of people around you that support you, want you to do well, then anything is possible. So I kind of want that to be seen as part of my legacy is that you can, you know, to follow, to follow that sort of route is, is, is possible for them. You know, you don't have to go the same way as everybody else. You can do it your own way. No, I love that. Thank you so much. And thank you as well for coming on. Um, the floor is now yours. If there's anything you'd like to say to anyone listening in terms of where to follow you and stuff like that, please do so now. Uh, thanks very much for having me on. Um, if anybody does want to follow me, I made it really simple for social media. <laughs> Everything is at team underscore ranking for Instagram, for Twitter, like at team underscore ranking. If you want to follow my journey in the boxing world, there's also a load of my music stuff comes on there too. So you can kind of uh, mix and match with all of that. So uh, yeah, but thanks very much for having me on today. No, that's right. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day as well. I will do. Cheers. Yeah, See you soon. You. If only they knew the hub for young business minds.